Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to give uh, participants a chance to get into the room here. I know Zoom did an update today, so some people have had to re-download. So I'd like to welcome you to Kingston Writers Fest. My name is Ara McCauley. I'm the operations manager for the festival and I'm pleased to present Couple Cold Snap Fiction. I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we generate this online presentation is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. We gratefully acknowledge these indigenous nations for their historical and ongoing guardianship of this land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility for stewardship of this land, its waters, and all of its biodiversity. All those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring these relationships in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Mm -hmm. We're grateful to these organizations and individuals who support the festival. Kingston Writers Fest would especially like to thank Tooney's Book Club, author patron of Shani Mutu, Canada Council, Heritage Canada, Ontario Arts Council, the City of Kingston and Kingston Arts Council. Also a special thanks to Tourism Kingston for their marketing support. And thank you to all those who have donated to or supported the festival. This event is 45 minutes long and includes a brief question and answer period. You can tell us where you're from using the Zoom Q&A function. You can post your questions for Shani there too. A reminder to complete our online survey for a chance to win a pass to next year's festival or a basket of books and you can check our website for details. I'd now like to introduce our author. Shani Mutu was born in Ireland, grew up in Trinidad and now lives in Prince Edward County. She is an author, poet and visual artist. Shani is the author of five critically acclaimed novels including Moving Forward Sideways Like a Crab, Serious Blooms at Night and most recently Polar Vortex which is long listed for the Scotia Giller Prize. Author Joe Minot calls Polar Vortex powerful, fraught and inventive, an intimate and starkly honest examination of the complexities of sexual identity, lust, shame and regret. Please welcome Shani Mutu. Thank you, Ara. Um, so Shani, you uh, would like to begin with the reading, is that right? Sure, I can I can start with um, a short reading to just introduce uh, the sense of uh, what's going on in the novel. So um, Priya and Alex are a couple and Priya has invited a friend whom Alex doesn't know very much about to come and visit. And this is well before he arrives. The novel is written in two voices, in Priya's voice and in Alex's voice. And I'm going to read, now I'll read a small bit of from Priya and later on I'll read a bit from Alex. So this is from Priya. In hindsight, I can say that when I, was when I was with lovers, BA, before Alex that is, I saw not them per se, but my own reflection. I related my life to them in stories and I recounted past personal dramas in detail. I have no memory if any of them ever told me theirs. If they did, I might well not have been listening. They provided me with opportunities to hear my story every so often as I related to them how I'd grown in life and how each new experience gave me a finer understanding of how I became the person I now was. Lovers BA provided me, in other words, the chance to give myself form. With Alex, on the other hand, this old tendency to command space and time with stories about myself dissipated. When she would ask about my past, I found myself newly bored by my own tales, the same ones I'd repeated elsewhere, wording and structures honed for desired responses. I wanted instead to be regaled by her. Such a thing hadn't happened before. It unsettled me. This drive to know every detail of her past seemed more powerful than sex. 
And I knew instinctively it was a sign that she was the person for me for life. But that morning when Prakash's message arrived, the old shape shifting that was once required of me to survive resurfaced. Even if I no longer need him, his reappearance coming at a time when Alex and I have tended to be off in our own worlds had the effect of igniting in me that old feeling that I could not let him get too far from me. For one cannot ever be too certain about what one's future may hold. Although I didn't respond to him immediately, it wasn't long after his name lit up in my inbox that I began to wonder if the calm in which Alex and I lived was possibly of the near beneath which lurked a disquieting incompatibility. And in other moments, I had an indestructible conviction that she and I were solid enough to endure the harshest of storms. There were moments then that I imagined showing her off to him and him to her. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. Um, so that's a great passage and a good introduction to sort of the three main characters in the book. Um, I love uh, the use of the word shape-shifting uh, in that passage. And I think that really draws on a theme that I, I saw throughout the book, which is this sense of um, identity and rep the way that we represent ourselves. Um, the way we view ourselves and what we hide. And that seems like a really central thing in the book. And especially in Praia, there are so many intersecting conflicts within her about who she is as a person, um, her sexual identity, her, um, her national identity, her uh, relationship with Alex and that strength. So I wonder if you could talk sort of broadly about the theme of identity and that conflict within her about how she represents her authentic self to the world. Yeah, well, you know, um, so when I started to write this story, I, I wasn't thinking about things like any of the things that you're talking about, mm -hmm. but of course they're all part of my own life. Mm -hmm. And they're very, very much part of my, my own existence. So they, they, they showed up and it's afterwards that, you know, people point out to me, oh, there's all this identity and, you know, these different things in it. But um, yes, I guess it's very much part of Priya's existence. And she has been from, she had been from, from her early existence in Trinidad before she moved to Canada. And then throughout her entire life in Canada, she's been doing this shape-shifting thing. So in some ways, she doesn't even know who she is herself. Mm -hmm. And so throughout the book, you have this constant um, questioning. Um, uh, she is questioning, she's questioning herself. She's constantly, um, uh, you know, asking, should she do this? Should she do that? Was this the right thing? Um, did she do the right thing? And she also doesn't remember a great deal of what has happened in her life. Or, or she misremembers or she remembers so that it suits the situation in which she is recalling it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I think, I, I, I tend to think of that as having a great deal to do with, um, you know, not being able to be out as a lesbian. And then even, you know, even in, in there's, there's a, a scene where she doesn't even, as a lesbian, want her gender as a lesbian, um, question too much. And she gets really upset when uh, Alex says to another friend something that makes her feel too girlish, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so everything is constantly being uh, worried about by, by Priya, but it's all in the service of 
either hiding who she is or revealing who she is. I mean, that's what the whole novel in a kind of a way is moving between that const those two things constantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there is, um, there's such a strength to her as a character and there are certain elements of her where she is so strong and so confident and then others where she's so uncertain. I mean, the first like third of the novel is just almost this long question um, where she's exploring herself. Um, yeah, like there are those pinpoint moments where she is really proud of her identity. Um, so it's an interesting contrast and I think like we have a tendency to say, oh, at that age, you know exactly who you are, but we really, you know, you realize that life doesn't actually work that way. Um, and I thought it was interesting, like the conflict um, within her queer identity, because there are, her, she has a, to say that at least she has a very complicated relationship with, with Prakash. Um, but uh, there is a hint that maybe there, was a shared attraction there um and there's a point where she said uh she's talking about her relationship with alex and she says i went along with the uncon uncontested assumption that i'd never actually been interested in being with a man and i wondered if um if often in the queer community i think like there is this sense that bisexuality is an inauthentic uh label with under the queer umbrella you know like it's not as as real as being gay or as being a lesbian and do you think like that's a conflict like something that she's pushing away i i i'm not really sure when you say that when you say that there was that you thought that there was a shared attraction in moments and then um and then in that section that you read where you where um she says that she's not sure that alex might have known that she was interested in being with a man not that she was attracted to being right. with a man um you know this is the thing that um priya priya was very confident in her private self but outside in the world she was not confident mm -hmm. So it's a it's kind of like she knew who she was, she knew what she wanted. There was no conflict there, but out in the world there was always a conflict. Right. And what she saw with Prakash was um when she was using Prakash in a kind of a way, right? Mm -hmm. Am I giving away too much? No, I, I think that's pretty <laughs> I think that's early enough in the <laughs> well established that it's not. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um Prakash was interested in her. He knew that she was lesbian. Mm -hmm. But uh in typical fashion, he felt he could, you know, he could deal with that, or she could deal with that once she was with him. And she'd be happy to deal with that once she was with him. But she also wondered if life in general wouldn't be easier with someone like him, with him, with a with a man. Right. So um and and you know, I find I find that really interesting um in in writing that because she wants to present to Alex a boyness. Mm -hmm. But when she's involved with Prakash, she becomes the girl from back home. Mm -hmm. And that is confusing to her. So, I mean, she's complicated. And it's one of the, the reasons, one of the things that I loved and hated about writing this character, mm -hmm. because that complexity. But right. it also was very frustrating because Normally, you know, you have um, the point of view of a character and it stays, it stays um, consistent and we know where that character is going. But I, when, when I started to get into Priya's head, um, there were constant questions. She would say, she would say um, I'm going to do this. Oh, but wait a minute. I could actually do this. And if I do this, the consequences are such and if but if I go this way, the consequences are such, which would I prefer? And that always led her to the next action. 
and sometimes she realizes that maybe she she did the wrong thing and then she has to back up and she makes all these excuses and so on you know that complexity i really enjoyed tremendously uh, in writing her and at the same time she was a very frustrating character because she was complex yeah i think she's the most complex character i've ever written mm -hmm. and from that point of view i really really enjoyed this and feel that it's um it's one of the stronger things i've written because i pushed i pushed well beyond what was comfortable for me right and i i got that sense as a reader because you know i there were times where i was frustrated with her where it's just like figure it out you know like but but we all go through that in our mind and especially when you're conf confronted with something that you've been suppressing and fearing um, and you're finally pushed to this place where you're not maybe quite ready to go. Um, so I, I really, by the end of the novel, I felt like I had a much deeper understanding of who she was, even though sometimes I would, I just maybe long for her to just have that, that clarity. So I, I appreciated that you were, uh, willing to challenge the reader too, because, you know, sometimes we, we we think we want complex but we actually want like paradigms and 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 characters that we can easily label or or categorize um and i guess speaking of uh as you mentioned um in re relation to your reading there is one section in the book where um it switches to alex and i wasn't expecting to hear alex's voice and, and see her perspective in it um and uh initially it, it was just it was kind of refreshing because it's a very like it's such a different very clean very logical perspective seemingly um and then some uncomfortable things come through in her thought processes as, as well but um was it always an idea of yours to, to introduce alex into the narrative in that way no in fact I was going to follow up with what I just said about why Alex came into it, and it is precisely because I, I, I had never thought to, to, to write Alex. Mm -hmm. It was always going to be Priya, but there came a point where I, as the writer, thought, wow, this person is really, she's really, um, she's really not being forthcoming now the the thing about the reader thinking this about alex is because a reader can actually see what alex what sorry what um priya is doing right mm -hmm. the, reader, the reader gets a sense that oh but wait a minute don't you remember priya that a few minutes ago you said this um so so i can see how the reader would also be be kind of saying, um, Priya, Priya, stop, stop. You're pushing yourself into a bad situation here, right? Mm -hmm. Now, that bad situation, it, it kind of follows through. But from a craft point of view, or a writing point of view, or a reading point of view, I felt, okay, you need, you need to get another voice in here. And that's why I decided, I mean, I thought, like, should I bring in Prakash's voice or should I bring in Alex? But, you know, this, this story, it's not a triangle, really. Mm -hmm. It's about Alex and Priya. Mm -hmm. And so their voices, those are the only two voices that were needed, except that in a kind of a funny way, Alex is the one who tames uh, uh, this bad image that Priya is sort of giving of Prakash. Um, Alex is the one who reveals Prakash in a much more, in, in, a, in a fuller way. And putting Alex's voice in there was an opportunity for me also to have someone else. And it was interesting to me to have a white person not be demonized as we tend, you know, in the stories of, um, um, of color and white um, alliances, there's always the sense that one is a victim and one is the uh, the um, 
the uh, abuser in a kind of a way. Right. And I wanted to give the sense that Alex had to deal with this character. Right. Uh, this character, not the character in the book, but this character she was living with. Mm -hmm. Alex had to deal with that. And Alex was also a witness to the Priya that Priya doesn't let us see. So right. Alex is revealing Priya as well. Mm -hmm. But Alex has her own story. That, yes. You know, <laughs> Yes, there are uh, certain things that we can't discuss without revealing key plot points, but um, I would encourage people to pick up a copy of the book uh, to find out what, what we're hinting at, because it's definitely worth exploring. Um, but I, I was going to say um, another, maybe another character in a way in, in this book is the landscape. Um, you know, it's, it's called Polar Vortex. And um, I, I loved the way that you worked in. Um, there was this ominous, like, season that they had just come through, um, where everything was locked in ice and snow. And it like, literally like froze birds into the water and things like that. Um, which is just this, uh, it's like both a beautiful and violent kind of imagery. And now they're in this uh, unseasonably warm um, winter. And um, in a way that unnatural warmth of that season felt a little ominous. And I don't know if that was a, an intentional thing, like where you fe feel like, this can't last, something's gonna change, this is too perfect. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, I, um, Ari, you know, when, when I'm writing, I don't, I, I don't actually have a plan where I'm going with things, mm -hmm. but I feel that once I alight on a, an idea, a rough idea, it's, as, it's almost as if, a universe around that idea is already constructed. And all, all I'm doing is moving with it, you know, and um, it, things come out. So that universe contains all the, um, all the, the consistencies and contradictions and the fears and the moments of aha and so on that I don't have to look for outside and say, okay, now I'm gonna put this down and now I'm gonna make the landscape be part of this. At the end of it, I am surprised that it works. Right. And I think that that's one of the things that, um, it's kind of like being in the moment of the story, writing it, mm -hmm. just having faith that those, that that's, that everything will come together if I'm being really, really honest in my writing process. But the reason that the landscape would be there is that I began to have conversations um, with a, a, a friend who's, which, she was doing work on my work. She's at uh, Waterloo University, um, Mariam Pirbay, um, about how as a Trinidadian, as a, 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 an immigrant to this country, I, like many immigrants who are writing, we tend to write across the big body of water, the Atlantic and the Caribbean Sea and so on, to, to write about our homes. And um, I wanted to, I found that that kept me outside of Canada. It's as if it served some purpose that was not my own to always keep me as the immigrant and the outsider. I love landscape just love landscape, any kind of landscape. And the other thing I found was that um, when I was in Toronto, um, you know, a lot of immigrants congregate in the big cities. And then the writing tends to be about their conflicts and so on in the city amongst each other with, you know, um, city life and the diversity of life in a city and so on. And when I moved to Prince Edward um, County, and there was so much lake and so much water and you know all these rivers and um, 
um, the, the forested landscape and so on, you know, um, tamed to an extent, but quite a bit more there. I wanted to get to know it. And I, talking with Miriam, I had, we, we, we talked about um, coming to the edges of the rivers and the lakes where we are and looking not across at the tourist vista that as even as even Canadians, I mean, this country is so incredibly beautiful that even Canadians are always looking at the photographic, um, you know, picture. Mm -hmm. I wanted to look down where my feet were and see what was growing there, what was living there, and to learn that and, and in a kind of way to become Canadian in that way, mm -hmm. in a very literal kind of way. And that has seeped into my painting, into my photography, my poetry, and definitely in this novel. And I was very, very affected. I don't know if you were you were you living in Kingston, say in the last um, the last five years, over the last five years. Do you yeah. remember that snowstorm, that ice storm? Sorry, with the polar vortex um, situation we had and the ice storm. Mm -hmm. That was phenomenal. There was a party right across the street. And within the space of about three hours, we, we, we were unable to get across the street because the ice was so thick. And if we had gone across even for one hour, we were worried. I mean, it was raining like, like, like hat pin sized icicles were coming down and uh, it was phenomenal. And um, that all became, it, it was a challenge actually, um, presented to me by uh, V.S. Naipaul at a dinner with him um, some years before, um, some years before, where I decided, uh, he, he said to me, he said to me, I should try to write where I am. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that is where I am too. And I wanted to try to really embrace that. Right. Yeah. yeah, mild winter is also, I mean, winter is not simply these harsh moments. It's also, there's also a mildness that is worrying because we need the rain and all of that. I mean, you know, I didn't think that when I was living in the city, but now that I live in the countryside and I can see the farmers, the, the, the vineyards, you know, the, we need the rain, we need the ice, we need the snow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, is kind of a, a good metaphor perhaps for relationships as well right if it's if, yeah. it's, if it's sunny every day then then things don't have an opportunity to develop and grow right all right yeah. <laughs> um i in one of the things that interested me in the relationship uh between priya and alex and i i think this is um i mean it's any kind of relationship where you get to a certain point where um you start to question comfort versus complacency um and uh Priya talks about them what is it da, 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 like two bonded birds in a cage um <laughs> and um yeah like the, i i feel like there like that's a tension in the novel as well and i think everyone has that sort of fear in a relationship but i wonder if you could talk about that a little bit too well i smile so broadly because any minute you never know one of our four parrots may start squawking right. <laughs> two, two of our parrots two caiques they are very very bonded and they live they're in they're in one cage mm -hmm. but when they have a conflict oh my god the house shakes with their sounds. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, there's some little bird moments in there that come out of my own um, love of birds and right. um, my knowledge of them there. Mm -hmm. But yes, there's, so, okay. So I'm writing this novel, I'm in the universe of the novel and it's moving along. And of course, at the end of it, when I come to the end and I, you know, put the full stop down and I stand back and I look and I say, what did I write here? Yes. <laughs> then I see what I have written, and that's when I can go back in and start strengthening things, you know. And that's one of the things that I found that Priya, Priya was taking this relationship for granted. And 
you know, that's um, the, the idea that um, she wasn't taking care of business. Mm -hmm. And Alex talks about that. Alex, you know, says like, what's going on? She's not very present. And um, Priya is so involved in covering her tracks as it were, that she's not paying attention to Alex, mm -hmm. which pushes Alex, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next word out. Yeah. <laughs> And that's that's uh, something that I thought was inter interesting too. Is that um, yeah, she's so focused on what she fears that she doesn't see the other threats that are around her. She doesn't see what is right there in front of her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I love that. I, I just I just love playing with that. I've never written anything like this before, right? Mm -hmm. um, like my my novels in the past, I always think of them as um, as idea novels. I'm pushing an idea, right? But this was like really trying to get inside of a a, a character, and the, the character is not real. But it's like, how do you turn this thing into not an idea that is moving forward, but into the complex craziness of an uh, of a human being? You know, right? Yeah. And it, it requires patience because like there are times where you're like, is he ever going to show up? You know, or are we ever going to get past her getting out of bed in the morning? Um, but it's because there's so much going on and, and you can really relate to that. Um, I think as a reader, like, again, we've all had those moments where it's just like, oh my goodness, <laughs> sort it out. Yeah. And it's, it's also step by step. Right. So, um, so, so, I, I found myself unable to jump on, as a writer, unable to jump from uh, her just wondering about these things while she's in bed and getting up straight to going to, um, to Alex because she knows there's going to be conflict when she goes outside. Right. So, so she also knows that she must get up. And I loved that. That is what began the whole. Do you hear the birds? Can you hear this? <laughs> that that began the um that sort of tension immediately, mm -hmm. um, where um she knows that she must get up. She's about to get up, and then she says, "Yeah, but once I do, this is what's going to happen." And it sends her off into different thoughts and so on, right? Mm -hmm. And. And that set the tone for the novel for me, mm -hmm. because it really was actually written fairly chronologically. Um, it, it was easy in that sense because I really was in her mind and in her body. And so, so it was easy in a kind of a way to move from A to B and it all, the story, the present of the story, as you know, all happens in 12 hours or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we're getting close to the last 12 minutes here. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to uh, read a couple of questions from the audience and actually, um, I think this this ties in well with it with talking about the creation of the book and how it was linear and um, Cindy asks how long did it take you to write this book not as long as it took uh, as it took the other books now when when I finished my previous book um moving forward sideways like a grab you know uh, writing kind of exhausts you and then the whole process of publishing and all of that and I just thought no, I just want to get back to my visual art and so on. But, you know, I began writing almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And it was, I thought to myself, I'm just going to write, every every time I begin a book, I think I want to write a really small book. Like I love, um, like Coetzee's amazing small books and, you know, um, who else? Um, Mary's Condé's small books. I, I keep wanting to write a small book. Finally, I did it. Uh, it a thin, you know, like a, a slim, slimmer book. Right. It didn't take very long to write it. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if it took two years, whereas the other books took um, like three to five years or so. 
Right. Yeah. Um, and um, we have another question that asks, did you read any books while writing this book? And if so, can you say? No, I can't, I can't read when I'm writing, but there are books that, that stay with me somehow. Mm -hmm. They're sort of like, you know, they're strapped to me in some way. Um, when I was, uh, when I was um, about 18, I read Virginia Woolf, like um, to, to the lighthouse and um, Mrs. Dalloway. And that, um, that actually, I think you can see a lot of that. I think I keep, it's that long ago that I read those books. Mm -hmm. And yet they stay this they stay with me that stream of consciousness thing and I, I think there is a, a, a contemporary version of stream of consciousness in in this novel. Right. Um, you know, I love um, uh, the work of um, Kotze and Zabold, the, the, the stories that are told and retold and so on, you know, um, Tony Morrison. Uh, Elena Ferranti, mm -hmm. I guess I read her before, well before writing this novel, but I was really, um, really drawn to the shifting, the shifting uh, sort of personal point of view. Mm -hmm. Unreliable narrator, so to speak. They right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, so I wasn't reading while I was writing, but there are there are works that that stay with me, you know, definitely. Earl Lovelace from Trinidad, Salt for rhythm and so on, you know, and the Dragon Can't Dance. Mm -hmm. And um, who else? Oh, the other one. I always think that um, that um, Melville was written by Moby Dick. <laughs> and, <laughs> And that's another another kind of storytelling that has stayed with me, you know, like kind of goes off and doesn't make sense and comes back. And but in the end, there is a big picture there. And I love I love that. Mm -hmm. And I, I do feel in, in a lot of ways, sort of like Sirius Blooms at Night, that those stories wrote me in a kind of a way, mm -hmm. Polar Vortex and Sirius Blooms at Night. Mm -hmm. um, that must be. I would imagine that's satisfying as an author to just feel like the story is propelling you as opposed to... Yeah, with Serious Blooms at Night, it was hard. I went into a kind of a hole. It was the first novel I'd ever written. I didn't know how to write a novel. I was never, you know, I wasn't, uh, yeah. So when, when that novel was finished, it took me like about three months or so to come out of that hole okay. of being in the characters. And in this one, well, fortunately, and I'm, I'm in a very, very, very happy um, circumstance in my life right now. I'm very, very nice home with my birds and my partner and so on. And I was able to go into the novel and, and you know, go into, maybe that's why I was able to go so fully into this character who was really shape-shifting from second to second, mm -hmm. because I could come back out and be at home and then go back in again. Right, and have that that stable outside. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're uh, getting close to the end, and I know that you had another reading that you had. Is, is there time, or, or should we? Um, other questions? Um, there's there's time for the reading. Um, we have a quiet audience today, so uh, and I, I think it would be a nice contrast to to hear from Alex a little bit too. Okay. Okay. You know the um the thing about the this whole COVID situation and um, doing these Zoom things. Mm -hmm. The best part of a festival is always being with the audience. I know seeing them and hearing from them and uh, signing books for them. I miss that terribly, but I'm really glad to see uh, uh you know the participants that they are participants there. And so if anyone wants to ask a question, I'm. I'm pleased. Yes. Okay, about Alex. So Alex now, now Priya has, uh, they're expecting Prakash,
But Priya has had to go out for a few minutes to drop this friend Sky back home because Sky dropped in unexpectedly. And she's left um, Alex at home and very worried that Prakash might show up before she, she doesn't want Prakash to be there before she is. But of course, he arrives before she gets back. So this is Alex now talking. When finally we heard the front door open, Prakash swiveled to face Priya as she entered the house but remained planted where he was and from him erupted ebullient laughter. He outstretched his arms and addressing both of us exclaimed, look at her, just look at you, long time no see. Still, he stayed where he was. I gathered he wanted to share the reunion with me so I leaned against the stove on my side of the counter and watched. Priya didn't take off her jacket and boots, but came through the house directly to him. The warmth of his greeting was touching. He clearly wanted to hold on to her longer than she wanted. Priya was less effusive. She seemed less delighted than I'd imagined she'd be. I hoped this was not for my benefit. She said to him, you're entirely gray. I'm not gray, he returned, his face seeming to feign a peevishness belied by the irrepressible grin he wore. He looked at me, an appeal it seemed, and I gathered this elaborate show of offense was a way of creating complicity among the three of us. He wore thin gold wire rimmed glasses and behind them, his eyes had turned misty. I thought I should turn away, leave them for a while, but I was more curious than ever about some obfuscated truth about their connection and did not want to miss any of this. So I continued with the task of removing the skin from the blanched tomatoes as I looked on. An inane banter about what time had and hadn't done to them both, Priya commenting that he'd come to resemble his father, at which he beamed. He reached for her and held on to both Priya's hands and attempted to pull her toward him. And that was a bit much, a bit theatrical, I thought. Perhaps she did too, as she stepped in toward him for barely a second and then, rather oddly, pulled her hand away. And although it seemed mostly because of the smile she wore, as if it were meant to be playful, gently slapped his cheek. There was an intimacy to that odd gesture that I admit made my heart skip a beat. But I didn't want to succumb to petty jealousies. Uh, jealousies. I needed, I'd earlier decided, to remain strong and focused. I couldn't have known for sure, but I thought hurt flashed on his face, despite the ensuing chortling, which I took to be a manner of defense. Priya removed her jacket and threw it around one of the chair stools on, at the island counter. She made her way around the counter as I slid the skinned and chopped tomatoes into the skillet with the softened onions and with more warmth than there had been between us earlier in the day, she wrapped her arms around me and kissed my cheek. She had taken on the scent of his lime and leather cologne and this was like a fist tightening around my heart. To an onlooker there would, I'm sure, have been no hint in the swift and ordinary, almost ordinary gesture for two people who lived together of the distress that hung like a heavy curtain between us. It is possible such warmth was an indication, a display either to him or to me, perhaps to him and to me of where her allegiance lay. It is possible too that in front of a third person, dispensing affection was less complicated, required less of us both than when we were alone. Her kiss on leaving the house with Sky earlier is a case in point. Uh, because of time, I'll leave it there. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, it was a pleasure talking with you this afternoon. Um, so a thank thanks you. a lot, Ara. Um, a reminder to everyone that Shani's books are available for purchase at Novel Idea here in Kingston. Um, you can order from them online or visit them in person um, or at your local independent bookstore. I uh, thank you. Hey, Ara. Yes. Can I just say that the audio version is also available on the 30th or the, the 28th or something? Oh, but absolutely. It's out. 
Awesome. <laughs> so there you go. You can enjoy it uh, wherever you are and in whatever activity you're doing. <laughs> so a thank you to Novel Idea Books. Um, a thank you, I should have mentioned this off the top, uh, to our arts partner for this um, event, which is the Real Out Queer Film Festival and Arts Project. Thank you to Book Hug Press, the publishers of Shani's book. And thank you, of course, to you, our audience, for joining us in supporting Kingston Writers Fest. A uh, reminder to be sure to join us again at 3.30 for Author Author featuring Joan Thomas and Jane Urquhart, and this evening at 7 p.m. for The Big Idea, moderated by Carol Off. I hope to see you then. And until then, everyone stay safe and stay well. And thank you again, Shani. Thank you very, very much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.